Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. This video that you're about to watch follows uh, the last video I published on the finished work of Christ, which I believe lays down a proper foundation for this epistle, as well as, well as any New Testament teaching. I think we ought to regard the subject of our fellowship with God and with one another uh, wherein the Christian's walk obviously plays a key role. I think we ought to regard that as tremendously important. I think we should look at that as a tremendously important subject. I mean, after all, we're only talking about our fellowship with, with God. Because it's a walk that we share in common. The word fellowship means to share in common. A relationship with God and with one another that happens to be the result of the perfect finished work of Christ and God's application of that in our lives. We cannot separate the person and the work of Christ from our life any more than we can separate the life of our Savior from His life. You know, who He was, uh, what He did on our behalf. In the third verse of our study here, uh, we've been studying together, uh, for you uh, just joining us, we've been studying together in the first epistle, uh, First John, uh, the book of 1 John, chapter 1. And in verse 3, we, we saw the, the phrase, the word of life, the, the words, the word of life. Uh, we know that, that His word is a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. This word of life, this, this is the life that Israel was blind to when it uh, came uh, to uh, their first encounter with the Messiah. When, he, when, when the Lord came unto His own and uh, they received Him not, when, when God became incarnate in human flesh, uh, the life that Israel remains blinded to even today, We heard God say through Paul in Romans 10, uh, Brother, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is for their salvation. For I testify about them that they are zealous for God, but not on the basis of knowledge, because they were ignorant of God's righteousness and sought to establish their own. They did not submit to God's righteousness. Knowing that in this present age, much of Christianity is the same because it walks in the same darkness as Israel did and still does. I want you to, to take note of the fact that verse 4 ended with, And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full, that your joy may be complete. And folks, we know that the law does not provide joy. So I want you to kind of highlight the fact that, that it is the Holy Spirit's expressed desire through the Apostle John to tell us that it is the longing and the heart of God Himself, God the Holy Spirit, God the Father, God the Son, the very fullness of the triune God, it is the heart, the very heart of God, that our joy would be made complete. And, and of course, against such thing as joy, there is no law. It has to come by another means. Most of us are familiar with, with how the book of Genesis starts out in, in chapter 1, verse 3. It's, uh, we read, God said, let there be light, and there was light. You know, the nature of light is that it produces life. I mean, without light, uh, there's no life. Uh, this, the sun gives life. Uh, 
the 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 sun s u n gives life the sun s o n gives life and first and foremost light represents truth just as darkness represents error john 17:17 17, 17, same author sanctify them through thy truth thy word is truth we are sanctified and set apart through the truth of the, of the word of god john 8:12 then jesus uh, spake again unto him saying i am the light of the world he that followeth me shall not walk in darkness but shall have the light of life so christ is both the word of life as well as the light of life the law came through moses we know that but grace and truth light came through jesus christ in our last study together we had uh, I reached verse 5 I think we've got a lot to look at in verses 5 through 10 this is a short first chapter but we've got a lot of ground to cover here and I'm going to try to do that as uh, as efficiently as possible looking at verse 5 this then is the message which we have heard of him and I want to stop right there. The word message in the original text is a word that's used only here. It's only used twice in all the New Testament. You, you, you'd think that that's kind of strange. I mean, the word message being what it is, it's, it's from the word agelion, agelios, message, a messenger. It's where we get our word messenger in Revelation when we were looking at the messenger uh, of the churches, the angel of the churches, the messenger of the churches, uh, whether you take that as real angels or whether you take that as human messengers, uh, pastors, teachers, uh, so on and so forth, uh, this, this word is unique to this particular context. In fact, it's so rare that... Uh, you wouldn't know that unless you were, you know, you dabbled in the Greek. There's only two occurrences of the word. This is the message which we have heard from him. And I think that what makes the word so so different and with all the derivatives that there are in the word angel and messenger or message, uh, agelion, agelios, uh, uh, with all the different variations of the word, I believe what makes this so unique is, is that this was a message that John says they heard of him, Christ. There's the Holy Spirit seems to be putting a lot of emphasis or importance on the on this message. And John says, this is the message we heard from him. And we declare unto you that God is light. God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. Verse 6, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Fellowship is grounded in truth. It, de it depends upon truth. Fellowship depends upon truth. Everything Everything hinges upon truth. Verse 7, But if in the light we should walk. Now, I don't know what version that, that most of you uh, use, what translation, uh, authorized version. The <coughs> I'm going to guess the King James Uh I'm going to be looking at a lot of this uh, from the original text, so you may want to take a highlighter and you may, may want to mark in your in your in your Bible if if for those of you who don't mind doing that, some of these particular words and how the, that they're used in, in the grammar, 
the meaning of the word as well as the grammar needs to be looked at. If in the light, we should walk. We should walk. And that's what we should do. We should walk in the light. The, the original text reads, if in the light, we should walk. And that is a subjunctive mood in the Greek. Uh, the subjunctive mood is the mood of uncertainty. Maybe we will walk in the light. Maybe we won't. Is what it's saying. But if in the light we should walk, as he is in the light, he is always in the light. He can't, in him there is no darkness at all. So you could, you could fairly translate that as he is always in the light. Then we have fellowship with one another. But not only that, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us, and that is a present tense. That is, He continues to cleanse us from all sin. And if you've watched these videos for any length of time, you know that I wouldn't, I would not come anywhere near to suggesting that what God does is He cleanses the old man. That He cleanses the old man of anything. The old man, the sin nature, uh, whatever expression that you want to use to describe the flesh. Something's being cleansed. Present tense cleanseth us from all sin. We, folks, are a new creation in Christ. Okay? And we are in possession as a new creation in Christ. We are in possession of both an old man and a new man. So, we very much are uh, this... what you know, mysterious third entity, okay? We're the essential us, the we, okay? If you want to look at it as the we, here. We are a new creation. We have both an old man and a new man, okay? Uh, we are those who know that a terrible warfare exists between the two natures where that we cannot do what we would, I guess the point I'm trying to get across here is that we are not our new man. It's, it's a mistake for Christians to say, well, I, I'm just, a, I'm, I'm the new man. You are not the new man. You are a new creation in Christ in possession of a new man. But God did not eradicate the old man. He didn't annihilate the old man. He didn't destroy, do away with, gone, okay, the old man. Uh, if he had, it wouldn't have been conducive to, to our walk, our relationship with the Lord. It wouldn't have served any, any really great, good purpose in, in our growth and grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The conflict must exist. It wouldn't be conducive to, to our relationship with Him if it, if it did not exist. If there wouldn't, in fact, there would really be no reason for faith. If we were the new man and we didn't have an old man and all we did was righteousness all the time, we never sinned, if that's... And God could have somehow, I think, maybe... Well, of course He could have. He could do anything. But that's, that was not God's intended purpose. That was not God's intended plan. We were meant to have this conflict. Because it is helpful to us. As, as awful as, as that conflict can be sometimes. We need to understand, folks. We need to look at this as we are neither our old man or our new man. We are a new creation in Christ in possession of an old man and a new man. Many of you are familiar with the seventh chapter of Romans uh, that we, but uh, 
where that we see that struggle between the flesh and the spirit, between the old man and the new man, that what we want to do, we don't do, we do the very thing that we don't want to do. And, uh, oh, wretched man I am, who shall deliver me? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So it's with a correct understanding of the finished work of Christ in mind and how God deals with the sin nature that we even approach verse 9. That famous verse, 1 John 1, 9. Without that foundation beneath our feet, which is why I wanted to do the video I did, the last video I did. Without that solid foundation, we're going to drag the rotten, filthy, stinking, dead corpse of the unchangeable old man into our, our sacred and, and special, worn-out ritual of constant confession of sins. You know, our, our own unique, filthy, unforgettable laundry list of failures into that. We're going to drag all that into that special time of communion, of special communion with God, begging His forgiveness so that we can now get up feeling refreshed, re-energized, and loved again, okay with the promise that, that we'll, we'll try harder next time to be all that god wants us to be while at the same time mind you the same time he christ our lord jesus christ our propitiation our our only advocate not, not some priest or minister our only advocate and this while satan accuses the brethren day and night Jesus points to the blood. Dearly beloved, this may come as a shock to you, but God is not the least bit interested in us bemoaning our failures, repeatedly dragging our sins up before Him in some ritual akin to some pity party where that we constantly, we're constantly reminding God of all the sins that we can bring to bear that we can remember in our minds in our feeble minds in order to gain forgiveness all over again until the next time a guilty conscience drives us back to that place of dread our primary focus being not on Christ but on sin confession sin confess sin confession forgiveness sin confession forgiveness sin confession forgiveness just repeated over and over ad nauseum like like wash rinse repeat okay and that's our life okay that's our focus that is not what these verses here in this present context are, descri are describing. I want you to take note of the fact. H highlight this, underline it, put a little asterisk, do something to take note of the fact that we are being cleansed as we walk in the light. Okay? Which means we're sinning as we're walking in the light. We are being cleansed as we walk in the light. So for that to occur, we are sinning as we walk in the light. Why? Because we have an old man. Now we're going to be looking at verse 9, and I want you to pay close attention, okay, to the grammar here. If we should, that's a present tense, a subjunctive mood of uncertainty, maybe we will, maybe we won't. If we should confess, if we should confess, maybe we will, maybe we won't. That's the subjunctive mood. If we should confess, that is, to name all our sins, to, to, to keep a list and, and bring that, that list of sins to God and uh, for His forgiveness. Uh, and gosh, he Lord help us if we forgot any. That's not what that's saying. That is not what that's saying. If we should confess, the word there for confess, folks, is homo legeo in the Greek. It's a compound word, okay? 
which means to speak the same thing that God says about our sins. The, the same thing God says about our sins. Our sins... Uh, plural. It was, it was sin singular in verse 8. Okay? And now it's sins plural. Sin singular in verse 8. Now it's sins plural. What does it mean to confess? Well, most think that that means naming our sins. That's the popular idea. Asking for forgiveness, which, by the way, isn't even stated in the text anywhere at all. You know, well, at least all of the sins that we can recall. Maybe we keep a list or something on sticky notes someplace. I'm, you know, I, I don't know. Confess here, homiligeo, means to speak the same thing as another. That other here being God. So it, 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 it is in, to our best interest. It, it really behooves us to know what God has said about our sins. If we're to say the same thing that God says about our sins. Now, of course, that's a lot. He said a lot about our sins, we know that. We know that's, that's a lot of ground to cover. But I think we can condense this down just a little bit. Of great importance is the fact that our focus is not to be on our sins at all. Romans 6.11, I've talked about this in previous videos, folks. This is not something that I made up. This is a fact, the very first command given you in the New Testament. The first one, the first command God gives you is to reckon yourself dead to sin, but alive unto God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Our focus is not to be on our sins on our failures, okay? The flesh. That's not where we reside, folks. That is not where our attention is. Is to be. That's not where our attention, our attention is to be. Our focus is not to be on our sins at all. Not at all. And the context here is one of joy, fellowship with one another, and God, and how we're to walk. That is, live, behave, conduct ourselves, our walk. If we should, present tense, confess, that is, say the same thing God says about our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And that's an aorist tense, folks. Aorist tense. That's, that sees the action as a whole. And the word forgive is a me there in the Greek. It is, it is to move, out, move aside, move out of the way. Okay? He's faithful and just to move those sins out of the way. Okay? We know from Colossians 2.13, And you being dead in the trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh... He made alive together with Him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. Okay? Folks, if you are going running to this verse, to, and if you are naming your sins for forgiveness, okay, just to walk away and try harder not to sin, when the law is the strength of sin, the strength of sin is the law, then you don't realize what you're doing. You're walking according to the flesh. The old, you're, you're pouring gas on the fire, okay? You're walking according to the flesh, walking according to the old man. The, the very thing, the very entity, the very nature that God has nothing to do with because the flesh profits nothing, okay? If we say the same thing God says about our sins, we are cleansed, aorist tense, Okay? Of all unrighteousness. If we should say the same thing God says about our sins, He is faithful and He's just to forgive us. He is just. Why is He just? Because of the obedience of Christ. I got to take you back to Romans 5.19. For as by one man's disobedience, that is Adam's, the elect were made sinners, so by the obedience of the one, 
Jesus Christ shall the elect be made righteous. Romans 3.26 That he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. God is just, folks. Faithful and just to forgive. Aorist, okay? Aorist tense. He did that. He did that in Christ. God is not cleaning up the old man. He's not helping us, helping the flesh do better. Okay? He's not interested in a long list of, of failures. Your long list of failures. It's not conducive to the relationship that we have with Him. It serves no purpose whatsoever for us to get together with Him and have a pity party over our, the sins that He's told us to reckon ourselves dead to. I mean, and, and we're not talking... Romans 6.11 isn't, isn't reckon yourself dead to sins, plural. It's reckon yourself dead to sin, that is the sin nature, Okay? God has nothing to do with the flesh. Nothing. Nothing. If, if you are trying to, have, to get God to have something to do with your flesh, to, to help you imp, imp, help improve the quality of your life, the, your walk, to help you perform, to, to make you better, to make you more... Uh, I don't know what, look like a Christian, talk like a Christian, walk like a Christian. If, if, that's, if that's your idea of what the Christian life is, then you've missed seeing Jesus Christ. Okay? I, I, that's just the, the plain, simple truth of the matter. You cannot be focused on the flesh and Christ at the same time. The learning process, folks, that we go through is to be is to be taken away from that 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 whole removed from that whole idea of some relationship with with God that's based on human merit. Okay. Uh, if you've watched this channel for any length of time, you know that that is not where where this ministry. Is that I don't preach to the flesh. I don't have anything to say to the flesh. And neither does God. Neither does His Word. For what the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. Okay? And we know that our garment may be polluted by the flesh. Okay? We know that. Just, just from one verse in Jude. And, and others save, that is rescue with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh that spotless garment because we stand before God holy unblameable and unreprovable in his sight you stand without God before God folks spotless blameless that's how you stand before God we have put off the old man we put on the new man that garment that we wear is the very righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ that's what we put on but it can be spotted by the flesh. Polluted by the flesh, according to Jude. Chapter 1, verse 23. The message we received from Christ, which we proclaim to you, is, is not that we have no sin. Verse 10, if we say that we have not sinned, and that's a perfect tense, if we say that we've never sinned, okay, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. 
You'll notice that back in verse 6, we're doing the lying. But if we take the position that we just discussed in verse 10, we're making him a liar. We're making God say things that he never said. God said he made you righteous. He says that he made you righteous when you were not seeking him, working for him, when you were his enemy, when you couldn't please him. And John is saying, or the Holy Spirit is saying through John, if we are saying that we've never sinned, then we're not giving you the word of God. We're not presenting the word of life. We're not presenting Christ. It's important that our testimony be this book, folks, the word of God. No matter what the cost. And just leave our humanistic ideas out of it. The guesswork. Leave the guesswork out of it. John is saying that if we say we've never sinned, if that's what we're saying, then we're not, we're not giving you the message that we received from Christ. God says the natural man cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God. He says that the natural man cannot hear God's Word. He says that the natural man cannot come to God, that only his sheep can believe. Only his sheep can believe. And yet you live in a day and an age when without a doubt the modern Christian church says that in order for you to become one of his sheep, you got to do something. John chapter 10 says if you're not his sheep, you can't do it. We've turned it around. God says you have to be my sheep to believe. The modern church says you have to believe to become his sheep. Something's wrong, folks. Okay? One of them makes God a liar. If we don't understand as we begin this study in 1 John that sin, our own personal, rotten, filthy flesh, is not the primary focus here. It's, it's not that, well, it's not even the focus at all. What am I using the word primary for? It's, not, it's nowhere seen as the focus. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Our struggle is not against the flesh, the old man. Okay? That is not where our attention is to be, our affection is to be. Our affection is to be on Christ. I hope that you're seeing that as, as you go through these studies with us. It is, it's my constant prayer. My constant prayer that, that you would grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Grow away from sin, self, the law, Satan, the world. All of those things that we died to, that we see that we died to in Romans chapter 6 and 7, Colossians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 2. I've often said if all we ever did was, was just thank God for all of the wonderful gifts that He's given us, for all the grace that He's bestowed upon us, if for all of the work that He's done in our lives, for everything He's done, is doing, and will do, if all we did was give praise and honor to God for that, folks, we would not have time to do anything else. There certainly wouldn't be time to focus on the flesh of, and trying to clean up the old man. Folks, you're going to sin. You know, it doesn't matter wh whether you're a believer or a non-believer. You're going to sin. You have an old man. God did not eradicate the old man. Yes, he crucified this self. When Christ died, we died. But when He was buried, and when He He was buried, we was buried with Him. We we know this from from Romans chapter six and seven. We were raised with Christ to walk in newness of life.
sin is such an enormous hang up for Christians today, folks. And it, it, it can become a, a, a really complicated, twisted up mess. I mean, your life can just become twisted up like a, a bunch of knots. You know, it, in trying to, to figure out and sort through, you know, all the agonizing aspects of, in, in trying to understand Scripture and trying to, to read it and to understand it and study it, it, it takes work. But we have to, at some point, folks, we have to come and, and believe God and trust God that what He says is true and not, and not bounce from truth to truth through the Word of God with such a short memory. Well, I, I know that, you know, it, that Romans 6 11 it says for me to is a command by God to reckon myself dead to sin well what does that mean dead to sin but alive unto God notice there's two aspects of dead to sin but alive unto God you know that is such a fabulous verse folks and yet you 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 hear it you seldom hear it talked about I'm going to be totally, completely honest with you. I have never in 33 years of ministry have I ever approached 1 John 1, 9 in the way that modern Christianity does. Where that I felt I had to list, name my sins, bring my sins up, as many as I could remember before God, so that He could forgive me to ease my conscience so that I could then go out and try a little bit harder where I don't have to come back to, and confess so much uh, to God about my sins because practice makes perfect, right? I mean, you know, I'm just getting better at it. So it may take some time, but just, Lord, just be patient with me. You know, uh, I'll get there eventually. There, there is such a mindset that's ingrained in the believer today that we're, that we're th this whole idea of Christianity that, that it's one, it's a system that is based on human merit. It must be. It has to be because we, we've got to give the, the, the kid that tries hard an A. And the kid that doesn't, we've got to give him, a, him an F. You know, it, it is, it's, it's how we were raised. We were literally born into a world based on human merit. But Christ came and changed all that. And of course, I'm, I'm sure, I'm positive, I have no doubt whatsoever that God is well aware of the fact of how difficult it is to dislodge that thinking from our experience. But I challenge you all to take some time, go through the Word, and I'm particularly talking about the New Testament, and, and I'm particularly talking about Paul's epistles, but, but we're seeing the same thing in John. Take the time, folks. Just take the time. Go slow. Meditate. Pray. Along as you go. For the Lord to highlight these aspects of His Word. So that you can clearly see that what He's saying is not m what much of modern Christianity today is saying at all. It's just the age that we live in. It's become increasingly worse since the first century, since John and the, and the disciples were alive. You won't find an example anywhere in, in any picture of, of the New Testament of Christ in his relationship with his disciples were that he's encouraging his disciples to, to come to him in confession of their sins so that he can forgive them, so that they can go on and, and try a little harder the next time. Christ didn't minister to the flesh, and, and so neither should we.
Look, I love you all. I truly do. I hope I've shed some light on this. We're going to look more at this as the, the days go by. I hope that you are all well. I trust that you are all safe and well. I want to thank you for all of your continued support and all of your comments and your love and uh, that you've shown us here at Blessed Hope Forever. Scripture says that we've died to six things. Six. We've died to sin. We've died to self. We've died to the law. We've died to the world. We've died to Satan. And we've even died to death itself. Yeah, we have. We've died to death. Death means separation. We've been separated from the whole reality of being separated from God. We'll never be separated from God. Been separated from the law. Separated from the old man, from self. Yeah, the old man exists, but we've been separated by death. We've been separated from sin, self, the law, the world. Satan. Satan has no hold over us. If you can bring that into these verses, it'll help understand. It'll help. It'll go a long way in helping you understand at least what the, our view here at Blessed Hope Forever and what we're talking about when, when we look at these verses. These verses, verses 5 through 10, I believe, are packed full of truth. We cannot, the, me, the message that John received from the Lord himself, that, that they proclaimed, him and others proclaimed, who were witnesses of our Lord Jesus Christ, God of very God, the incarnate, Son of God, the one who came to die in our place. The one who rose again from the dead. If we say that we don't have a sin nature, we're walking in darkness. If we say we've never sinned, we're walking in darkness. If you are walking in the light, okay, that is in the truth. If you're walking in the truth of, of God's word and what he says is true about you and him. If you are doing that. You won't find time for any of this other nonsense that has to do with the flesh and failure and sin and uh, some, you know, re repeated uh, worn out, old worn out uh, ritual, you know, that's uh, re replete with old worn out cliches, you know, that in this whole attitude, this whole mindset of approaching God, uh, folks, it, Hebrews tells us that we we have a right to boldly approach the throne of grace to find help in time of need. There is nothing, nothing, okay? And I mean nothing that you can possibly do as a Christian to make yourself more righteous than what you already are in Christ. God made you righteous. He declared you righteous. That, that, that's a truth, a simple truth, too, that, that, that I wish so many Christians knew and, and understood today. Because if they just had that one truth beneath their feet, it would carry them a long way. Look, I'm out of time. Uh, I'm just rambling here. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, I come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So very thankful for your word, for the opportunity you've given us to, to feast upon it, to think about it, to meditate on it. Oh, dear Lord, let your word be our, that lamp unto our feet. 
Help us to grow in grace and knowledge of you. Filter out all of the foolishness, but just seal to our hearts that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen.